It's my experience that typically if you're doing those updates to show the um, to just show the one table and then do the because look at it this way if you change the department name are you really changing the department name in the department table or are you changing the department that the employee is associated with you run into a lot of confusion and stuff that happens automatically doesn't happen automatically and it's not that, again that you can't code your way around it but typically as my experience I found it to work a lot better and a lot more maintainable if you go in and you just edit the one table. All right. To answer your question, if you did that, what would you have to do? Could you make that field not editable? Could you make that field? Well, you could always do that. But I mean, oh, the, de the department name. Well, how would you change the person's department then? I guess you'd have ID in there too, and have your little drop down. Yeah, that you see that that would be that would be ambiguous and confusing. Uh, oh. You probably could go in and create a template field from it, show the department name, and then when you edit, go and show a drop down and bind that back to the department ID. But again, that's the exact kind of thing that that sometimes can be problematic and, and lead to confusion. All right, let me show you one thing about this that I neglected to mention. When I edit the data bindings, by default, that is checked, two-way data binding. And that, for the most part, should always be checked. Two-way data binding means that it will use the data or the department ID from the employee to pull up the value in the drop down. So if I am in the finance department, when I go in to edit, the selected row in the drop down will be finance department. So that's one half of the double binding. The other half of the double binding says if I change the value of that drop down, then the department ID in the employee table will also get changed. Which is probably what you want to do, right? I mean, you're not going through all this trouble not to change the department ID. So I probably want to have it so that, yeah, when I view this, this drop-down originally, it populates with the choice, you know, that's in that table. And then when I change it, I want to take that change and, and update that table. So the double binding, two-way binding should be checked. Now you might say to yourself, well, what about when I view an employee? All right. If I go in and view an employee, I see the department ID, I don't see the department name. Now when I go and edit that employee, then I see the department name. But it would be nice if I could see the department name without having to edit that employee. Fair enough. All right. So what do we do? Well, we do the exact same thing again, but we do it to the item template, not to the item update template or edit item template. So let's go in here and let's look at on this grid view or details here. For department ID, notice that there are several templates. There is a item template, which is when it gets displayed. There's the edit item template. There is an insert item template. If I want it to be displayed as a department name instead of the department ID, I'll go in here and I'll Again, edit that template. So I'll go here. I will create a SQL data source. That pulls up from department. <coughs> I'll go and 
create a drop down. I'll choose that data source. And I'll edit the data bindings to associate this with the department ID. So now when I run this, I'll go in and if I click on Joe, it shows me absolutely nothing. Well, because a drop-down will show me the Did name associated with an ID. Drop-down already has that mechanism in there. change that you know you're not in edit mode. Well the easiest way to get around that is simply go in and set the properties of this and make it a drop down. Um, it's a half noble reason, a half lazy reason. All right. The half noble reason is, is consistency. Because when I go and click on this then, edit, I now see, I still see a drop down. It's just that that becomes enabled. All right. So that's consistent. The lazy reason of it is if I were to make a label I'd have to do some custom coding to go and take that label and find the department name that goes with that department ID and stuff the department name into that label. Where Dropdown already has that mechanism. Dropdown already takes a, um, takes a um, ID and, and displays the name associated with that ID. So it just seems like an easier way to do it, much more straightforward way to do it. If you need your SQL statement, only pick out the one department. Which SQL statement? Um, your, your SQL data source. For what? We have Didn't a, you create an SQL data source for that? Yes. And couldn't you have done it to get just one department? I like suppose. Name? Yeah, I suppose. But you can't bind <clears throat> the data to um, like a label or something. It doesn't have that same. I don't. I. I. I, I yeah. I don't. Well, okay. Um, yeah. I. I don't. I don't believe that you could do it that way. Not without more work. Again, this is a more straightforward way to do it. Because again, it already has a mechanism in to take the ID and display the value for it. So again, you could write code to do that, but, and you could write code to only pull that one name, but um, 
it's not as easy as using the, 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 the natural mechanism of the drop down to do that. All right. What is left for us then on this? Now, do keep in mind that I'm not talking about every single thing that we can do with templates, right? But no, whenever you want to deviate from that default behavior, displaying the data in a label, using a text box to edit it, that's when you need to switch to a template control. That's where you need to convert it into a template control. Because then you can go in and you can change the item template, the edit item template, and eventually the insert item template. All right. Now, one thing that we haven't done yet is inserts. Let's look at what an insert statement looks like. An insert statement, let me rephrase this, the flavor of the insert statement we're going to use is going to insert one row at a time. It's only going to insert one row. Again, a lot of the, the most fundamental stuff that you do on a website concerning a database is about doing one row sort of manipulations. You're inserting a row. You're updating a row. You're deleting a row. It's not to say there isn't SQL to do other things, but typically if you think about it, you're doing stuff row by row by row, which implies, again, you need the primary key for that, uh, that row. But anyhow, let's look at an insert statement. Let's look at what it will take to insert a row. An insert statement looks like this. Insert into employee. Then you have a list of columns. All right. Amp name. Email. Department ID. Get the rest of them down. Social security number, image name, and salary. Values, well, if we were writing, if we were hard coding one, would put the values of each employ uh, of each of the field in. String fields being enclosed in quotes, numeric fields being not enclosed in quotes, and so on. But again, we don't always want to insert the same employee over and over and over again. Therefore, we're going to replace that with parameters. And the number of question marks should match the number of fields I have there, which it does. There's six of each. And then those are going to get filled in at runtime. More, you know, more, more relevant, those will get filled in from the values in, 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 the, in the details view that we go to insert. Now, you might notice something missing from that insert statement. What's missing from that insert statement? Primary key. Primary key is missing from the insert statement. And why is a primary key missing from the insert statement? It's an auto number. It's an auto number field. And so therefore it will get automatically incremented. So there's no real need for us to remember um, or, or to put that on the insert because every time we insert a row, that's the one that, that gets, um, you know, that, that field get generated the, 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 the value of it. So I'm going to go and I'm going to put the insert statement 
on the uh, data source, yes. Um, what is, uh, is this smart enough to know that, say, if we don't put some uh, value in M image, that it will skip that and then put the salary in the correct well, place? No. This is expecting six values. I can't give it only five values. Okay. If one of the values is null, that's okay. All right? But, for example, I couldn't do this. Right. Right? Because then it has no idea, well, which one's missing. Right? So if the user doesn't put anything in that image, it will just say it's null? Yeah. Okay. So in other words, yeah. Um, that, that, that question mark, again, could be a null value. Okay. So, so it, it could be a null, but there, is, there will be a value for all of them. I see. Okay. All right. So let's go in and let's put this insert statement in the SQL data source. And then let's get into details view. So I'm going to go into my SQL data source and I'm going to say I'm going to type it exactly what I had there, insert into employee So this should be just exactly what I had written on the board a minute ago. Okay, should be correct. should be able to go in and select that I want to enable inserting. All right. There's always sort of the two pieces of this. There's the data source, which is the connection to the database and the instructions that you want to run when certain operations happen. And then there's a visual aspect of it. And like Susan said earlier, you could programmatically maybe allow some people to add rows into this table, and others not. So we could set that attribute to, to insert and edit. We can set it through uh, our design tools, so that will be the initial values for it, and then we can go and override those values, um, you know, through our code. All right, let's run this. Let's run this. Now you're going to notice something goofy here. We'll talk about the goofiness and we'll talk about how to correct that. Right now, we have to go to Joe and then there's an edit new and we can edit and that hopefully still works. But to create a new employee, I have to click new. Alright. And then I can put in Bill whose email is bill at department ID of one, social security number of something, no image name, salary, something. And then I can click insert. And syntax error in that. Okay. Let's Go and debug that.
use I might give the videos of this class next semester to my multimedia class and they have to edit out all the mistakes. <laughs> Probably end up with like 20 minute classes then. <laughs> New. All right. Bill, it's in the accounting department. All right. Must enter a value for social security number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, there we go. And notice it doesn't show Bill. It, it goes back to Joe. But if we go back and look here, we did, in fact, add Bill, and we added him to the um, appropriate department. Yeah, go ahead. Why did it complain about the Social Security number but not the other things that you didn't type on? Someone want to answer that for me. That's, that was a required field. The other fields weren't required fields. All right. So, the bottom line is, it allows me to do that, that way, but that's clunky. Let's talk about all the ways in which this is clunky. <laughs> all right. Number one, if I click on Bill, all right. Oops, I don't want to click on Bill. If I want to add a new employee, I shouldn't have to bring up an old employee and then click new. That's clunky right from the start. I should have a link that says, hey, I want to create a new employee. All right. Secondly, when I'm done entering a new employee, I probably want to go back to this screen to show that that new employee got entered and not redisplay the old employee again, which is what this did. All right. Again, this is where just using it right out of the box kind of gives you a real bad implementation. And you don't want to use it right out of the box. You want to go and adapt that instead. Now, here's a little trick that we can see. If we look at this details view, this details view has associated with it Somewhere here. A default mode. And there's three choices. There's a read-only mode. There's an edit mode. And there's a delete mode. I'm sorry. Did I say delete? I meant insert. Read-only. Uh, my, my head's ahead of where... where my mouth is, I think. <laughs> Read-only mode, edit mode, and insert mode. Now let's look at something else that's a little clunky. All right, something else that I don't like. I go in here, and I pick that I want to edit Joe. I have to hit Joe, then I have to hit edit. It seems like a long way around. It would be nice if it just popped right into edit mode, then I could go in and edit it. All right. So that default mode, though, of this page, uh, of this of this details view, says what mode it's going to be in, and my three choices are read only, edit, and insert. So I could make it so that. By setting this default mode, I could make it go directly into edit mode or directly into insert mode, depending on how I call it. So let's go and let's set the default mode of this details view to edit. All right. Notice what happens. It's now smack dab. It's in the edit mode. Right? And in fact, I don't have that edit and insert, I have update and cancel. Okay? So, what can I do? I can go in here and run this. And when I click on Joe, bam, I'm in edit mode already. 
pretty nifty. I don't have to waste the time going and clicking the other thing. I can go and change Joe's salary and click update. Oh, but I stay in edit mode. All right. We'll, do, we'll deal with that next. Okay. The fact that I stay in the edit mode. What I really want to do is I want to, if I'm done, I want to go back to this page. Right? Now, we've seen a case of doing some code after we have successfully updated or deleted. We put code on the item updated event. So let's go and look at that. What page was that on? Department, I think. Yeah. I'm going to go and go borrow a little bit of code. Pop it into my detail page, the code behind. I'm going to go into my SQL data source, and I'm going to say An updated callback function. Now, let's go in and let's add a label for the air. And I'm going to change this code a little bit. something in that label, I'm going to redirect the user to another page. I do that this way. And I can send them to the department search. So, now I go and run this. I go in, bring up Joe, I automatically go into edit mode, right, because I've changed the default mode of that details view to edit mode. I can go in and edit Joe's data and click, uh, click update. It updates it and sends me right back to the list. It's a lot cleaner way of, of doing it, all right? And if I go back in, I see Joe's data has been changed. I 